All right, so let's talk about chemistry. It's, you know, stuff. Uh, I'm not a giant fan here. I did take a lot of chemistry in college, which is probably why I'm not a giant fan. And there's a lot of chemistry that we're not going to touch on at all because I don't really care. Also, when you get down to it, right, all of physiology is a result of chemical processes and all chemical processes result of physical processes. We're not going to get into this. Um, we're going to touch on the chemistry that I need you to understand so that later when we talk about electrochemical gradients and, and ion channels and this sort of thing, that we're on the same page. By no means am I going to expect you to be balancing chemical reactions and calculating concentrations and molarity of this sort of thing. So uh, this is no substitute for an actual chemistry course. And if you've taken an actual chemistry course, this is going to be a, a giant basic review. Like I said, when we talked about uh, anatomy as a, a stepping stone, building block toward your overall healthcare education, chemistry is one of those sort of things too, where it, it, you're building on this for later. So everything's made out of matter. You're aware of this. Elements what matter is made out of. You can't break it down with ordinary chemical things. Um, all the elements are on, uh, you know, the, the periodic table thing. It looks like that. What, there's 114 of them on there. I'm fairly sure some of them are fake. I mean, seriously, 111 is three U's. That can't be real. When's the last time you heard of un, un, unium? Yeah, I'm out. So 114 of these things, how many of them do we care about? Like six. Six elements make up 98.7% of your mass. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus. There are six more lesser elements that make up pretty much the rest of you. Sulfur, potassium, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, and iron. That's not all you are though. There's still 12-ish uh, more what we call trace elements, less than 0.01% of your body. Now, again, by no means I expect you to memorize these or know their molecular weight or their atomic number. But anything outside those is typically pathological. Like you should not have mercury, lead, arsenic, or antimony in you. Um, that being said, those trace elements are still necessary. Iodine, for instance, is responsible for thyroid hormone synthesis. And it's integrated in the thyroid hormone zinc for some of the liver enzymes. There's tin in some of the immune response. I have no idea what molybdenum is, but it's a trace element. And there are amounts of it in you that are used in different things. Some of those are metals and in any higher quantity, they will be toxic. So they are found in very small amounts. The atom, not that atom. Disclosure, um, comic book person. So not that atom. The smallest particle of an element is still maintaining its unique properties, protons, neutrons, and electrons. There you go, an atom. Now, normally what we use is, is this one over here that says uh, planetary model. The orbital model is more correct, but not super helpful. A 
electrons orbit the nucleus in what we call electron shells. So that ring on the outside is an electron shell. The innermost shell, again, what you see here, holds two electrons. And the outermost shell, every shell past that first shell, will hold up to eight electrons. Luckily, uh, elements in your physiology won't cross over four. Atoms of different elements have different numbers of those subatomic particles. There's hydrogen, helium, and lithium. What makes them different elements are the numbers of protons in the nucleus. So there you see hydrogen with one, and helium with two, and lithium with three. Now the neutrons can vary even within the element. An isotope is an atom of a particular element with a different number of neutrons. They'll react the same, but they may have different physical properties. We see uh, hydrogen, for instance. Hydrogen has a couple of isotopes. There's hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. They're all hydrogen, and they all react as hydrogen. They'll all make water. D2O is heavy water. It's water with deuterium, which is hydrogen with an extra proton. Now, that actually has some practical application because there are medications uh, in the pipeline that uh, use heavy water in them because hypothetically they're more uh, active in terms of their actions. I don't know if any of these are, are currently on the market, but I do know of one that's, that's in the pipeline at the moment. Tritium, I believe, is the radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Most atoms combine chemically with other atoms, forming molecules, compounds. A molecule is just when we have two or more atoms bonded together. A compound is when they're different. Most matter will exist also as a mixture, rather than just as a pure substance. So here we have physical intermixing of components. So solutions are homogeneous mixtures like salt water. Something's dissolved in something. The solvent is the liquid in this case, and the solute's what's dissolved in the liquid. Concentration of solutions will be expressed in molarity or in milligrams per deciliter or even parts per hundred. So when you see like the, the saline bag and it's got concentration written on the side, it's just telling you how much stuff is dissolved in that, that liquid. A colloid is, uh, when you've got big particles that don't settle out, think um, like fruit floating in jello. And a suspension is when um, you've got um, solutes that, that will settle out, like, like blood. If, you leave, if you've ever done this, if you leave blood sitting out, like the red blood cells will sink to the bottom. So then you have a solution, a colloid, and a suspension. Now, in any of those things where we have mixtures, you don't have any chemical bonds that are formed. You're just mixing stuff together. We could, we could separate the fruit from the jello, separate the red cells from the plasma, or even the salt from the water. Compounds, however, are something different. In compounds, you have a chemical bond, and you can't take that apart without breaking that chemical bond. They're all homogenous, which means that you can't see the difference between the different elements that are in this compound. For instance, uh, salt is sodium chloride. You can't see the sodium and the chloride, nor can you separate the two um, without breaking a chemical bond. More on that shortly. So chemical bonds happen because, like we said earlier, those electrons are outside the nucleus. And except for the first shell, which has two electrons, each successive ring there wants to have eight. And it will react in such a way so that that can happen. We care about three types of chemical bonds, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen. First, let's talk about ionic bonds. An ion is an atom with a charge. The reason it has a charge is it has unequal number of protons and neutrons, or sorry, excuse me, protons and electrons. 
ionization is transferring electrons from one atom to another. So here uh, we have sodium and chlorine. Now, sodium's atomic number is 11. That means that it's got two electrons on the inside ring and then eight. And then it has one lone electron in that outermost ring or the valence shell. It would really like to have eight. So the easiest thing for sodium to do is just to give away that electron. Now, sodium in a pure form is a metal. Soft, you cut it with a butter knife. Um, it will also burn in the air, throw it in water, and you get a lovely fireball. If we were in class, we'd do it. No, actually, we wouldn't do a demo. They won't let me have any of this. Stupid Homeland Security, their stupid rules about fiery metals. Blow up one block of sodium and you don't get to fly for like two years. Chlorine over there is in its form, it's like a green toxic gas. You'll see that it has uh, 17 protons, which gives it seven electrons in that valence shell. Again, it would like to have eight, so it will pick it up. It will pick up an electron. Electrons have a negative charge. So now, At the bottom here, we see sodium and chloride. Sodium, the sodium ion, has given away an electron. You lose a negative, now you've got a positive. So that Na positive there is the sodium ion. And that Cl negative there is the chloride ion. An anion, in this case chloride, has gained the electron, so it has a negative charge. A cation has lost the electron, so it has a positive charge. Awesome. Now we have positive and a negative and ions, just like people, opposites attract and they stick together. An ionic bond is when oppositely charged ions stick to each other and form this ionic bond. They're not sharing electrons. Those little rings are not hooked together where they've got joint custody of the electrons. They're not very strong bonds, drop them in some water and you can disassociate them. They tend to form crystals. There's sodium chloride as a lattice and this is the sodiums and the chlorides. Um, here's what salt looks like. That's sodium chloride. So we take this metal that burns in the air and this green toxic gas and you get salt. Now notice that salt, table salt has neither of those properties. It's not a green toxic gas and it's not a, a metal that burns in the air. It's a new substance. You can't, you, the sodium and the chlorides don't, don't come apart into those forms, into those pure forms. This is one of the things that you do need to understand about chemical bonds is that when we get a compound that that compound has its own unique chemical properties. This was an issue with uh, a uh, preservant that was used in uh, vaccines a while back and uh, that had mercury in it. And people were upset that the vaccines had mercury in it. But again, it wasn't like it had a liquid silver metal in it. That mercury was part of a bigger compound that had its own unique chemical formula and its own unique chemical properties. So it's not as if it separated out and then you had free mercury. It was part of the bigger overall compound. So when you eat salt, right, the Sodium is not going to come off and burn you from the inside out. Covalent bonds are when we do share electrons. These are stronger than the ionic bonds because the, the atoms get joint custody of electrons, so they're physically linked together by those electrons. Here's a single covalent bond between these two hydrogen molecules. And you can see they're sharing those electrons. 
So now they can both say they have two electrons in the valence shell. They're sharing the two of them. Here's another single covalent bond between uh, nitrogen and those three hydrogens. So now nitrogen has its requisite eight and hydrogen has its two. Each of those hydrogen protons there can say it's got two electrons in the valence shell. There's a double covalent bond where we've shared two pairs of electrons here in carbon dioxide. Carbon's very good at this covalent bond thing. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, if we go back and look at carbon dioxide, you'll see that the electrons are shared pretty equally, right? Um, you've got eight outside of oxygen, you've got eight outside carbon, you've got eight outside the other oxygen. That's not always the case. When electrons are shared equally, we call that a nonpolar covalent bond. But if the electrons are shared unequally, we call that a polar covalent bond. So down there with that oxygen, and I know it says carbon, but it, it's an oxygen molecule. When you see that oxygen hydrogen bond down there, um, the, the oxygen here has eight electrons in the valence shell and the hydrogen just has two. So electrons are negative. So that means that the oxygen side of this is more negative then the hydrogen side, this little symbol down there means partial negative or partial positive. This sets up a different situation where we can have something called a hydrogen bond. Now hydrogen bonds are the weakest of the bonds. It is the weak attraction between polar molecules. No sharing of electrons. Now while they're really weak, they're also really important to our physiology. Here's hydrogen bonding in water. And you can see that this slight positive right here for hydrogen and a slight negative right here for oxygen are attracted to each other and they hold those molecules together. This gives water very unique properties. It keeps it a liquid at a, right, a wide range of temperatures and it allows it to act as sort of the universal solvent. Two terms you need. Hydrophilic molecules are polar substances that will dissolve in water. Hydrophobic molecules are nonpolar substances that will not. Here's water as a solvent. Water molecules stick to each other with these hydrogen bonds. They stick to other things. They, they adhere to things, they have cohesion. Um, water sticks to itself. This creates surface tension. So here's a water strider, which is an insect, not a spider. You can see those hydrogen bonds there where its feet are pressing into the water. It's not pressing hard enough to break those hydrogen bonds so it can walk across the surface of the water. Now, chemical reactions happen when these molecules interact with one another. When you see chemical equations, you'll see the molecular formula for each of the things involved there. And I'm not worried about you balancing reactions. So here's chemical equations. There are different types of chemical reactions. Here we see a synthesis reaction where we're putting stuff together. We're forming chemical bonds. Now, synthesis reactions are anabolic reactions. Anabolic means building. When you see the term anabolic, what that means is we're taking little things, we're putting them together into a big thing. So in this case, we're connecting amino acids together to make a protein. Anabolic reactions tend to need energy to move forward. The opposite of that is a decomposition reaction. A decomposition reaction is a catabolic reaction, meaning that we're breaking something down, we're taking something big and we're tearing it apart into little pieces. These tend to release energy. In exchange reaction, we're doing both. We're breaking some bonds, we're making some bonds. Here's an exchange reaction. 
Now, in this case, we're taking a phosphate from ATP and the energy that's contained in that bond and moving it over there to glucose. All chemical reactions will either release energy, catabolic or exergonic reactions, or they will contain energy. They'll bring energy and it takes energy to make them proceed. Endergonic reactions or anabolic reactions where we're building something. Hypothetically, theoretically, I suppose, all chemical reactions are reversible and will proceed to equilibrium where there's not a forward nor reverse reaction. But in our biology, for the most part, the chemical reactions are not reversible because it would require too much energy to go the opposite way. And quite often the products are removed as soon as the reaction takes place. Think about the process of digestion and chemical digestion where we're breaking proteins down into amino acids. We're not reassembling that into the, the same protein because those amino acids are, are moved away into the bloodstream very quickly. How quickly chemical reactions take place is determined by the temperature. The hotter it is, the faster it goes. The particle size, the smaller the particle, the faster it goes. And the concentration of the reactant, the more stuff there is, the faster it goes. A catalyst increases the rate of a chemical reaction without chemically being changed. An enzyme is a biological catalyst. And enzymes are super important for how physiology works. An enzyme is a protein that acts as a biological catalyst because many chemical reactions that take place in the body need to happen very quickly. So we use an enzyme to make that happen. Now, other compounds that we'll talk about, salts or ionic compounds, they can form crystals. Some of them conduct electrical currents. We have electrolytes. Acids and bases are electrolytes. An acid is a proton donor. Um, you're really looking for that hydrogen proton. And a base is a proton acceptor. More on acids and bases much, much later. Um, I'm not worried about you uh, calculating a acid base concentration, um, but uh, when we say something is acidic, we're looking at that hydrogen proton. We say something's alkaline, we mean it's a base and it's pulling that hydrogen proton out. Um, acid base scale is the, the pH scale, which is the negative logarithm of the number of hydrogen ions in moles per liter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, acidic solutions have a pH lower than seven. That's important. And you should realize that it is a logarithmic scale. So something that has a pH of five is 10 times more acidic than something that has a pH of six. An alkaline solution is something with a pH higher than seven. So here's your scale from uh, 14, which is incredibly basic, to zero, which is incredibly acidic. Notice that on the acid side of this, you're looking at food things. And on the base side of this, you're looking at cleaning stuff. Things that are alkaline tend to not taste good. Um, one misconception is how you can change pH. Like uh, there's, a, we sell alkaline water now. It's not so alkaline that it, it makes a difference because it wouldn't be palatable if it was, and it might do some damage. And anything that you drink is dropping into stomach acid, which has a pH of like one, one and a half ish. So I mean it's gonna take care of that pretty quick and become an acid. So, um, yeah, there's really not much to the whole idea of the alkaline diet or alkaline water. That's actually a topic for another semester.
So moving up. Acid-based homeostasis we care about because changing the pH of stuff screws up how cells work and how enzymes work. A pH of your blood has a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. That's a pretty narrow range. Anything outside that and we have some issues. So we have multiple systems in play to regulate pH. A buffer is something that resists changes in pH. It will convert a strong acid into a weak acid or a strong base into a weak base. And here we have an example of a buffer here with this bicarbonate buffer. Again, really a topic for another semester. Now, most of what we talked about so far have been inorganic compounds, acids, bases, water, salt. Um, there's no carbon there. An organic compound, that's carbon. Carbohydrates, fats, proteins, nucleic acids. These are bigger compounds. They can form these big complex structures. And we've got lots of covalent bonds that form around this carbon. The ones we care about, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids. Here are some carbohydrates. It's called disaccharides, sucrose, lactose, maltose. Here's a uh, phospholipid. Here's ethanol and ethyl ether. And if we go back and we look, um, like all these disaccharides here, they all actually have the same molecular formula. The reason they're drawn out like this is so that you can see the structure because in organic chemistry, the structure is as important as the molecules they're in. When we look at these two things, ethanol and ethyl ether, they have the same molecular formula, C2H6O. But structurally, you'll see they're different. We've got that methyl group there. And then here you've got two of those groups with the oxygen in the middle. So here's your condensed structural formula there. That means that this is going to react differently. Ethanol is grain alcohol, um, right? It's, you can go buy ethanol, assuming you're 21, you can go buy ethanol. Um, pretty much the closest thing you get the pure ethanol over the counter is Everclear. Ethyl ether, not the same thing. Um, it's ether is volatile as everything. It evaporates very quickly. It's super flammable. Um, I suppose you could drink it, but that's not a great idea. It's probably really super toxic. Um, but if you breathe it in, it'll knock you out. So, a lot different. So let's start by looking at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates have the same rough formula, one to two to one ratio, CH2O. So for every carbon, you get two hydrogens and one oxygen. These are monosaccharides, the simple sugars. Now they're all structural isomers, which means again, they all have the same molecular formula. That's what isomer means. Same molecular formula, different structure. So glucose, lactose, fructose, those are our simple sugars. Your disaccharides, sucrose, lactose, maltose. And they're monosaccharides that are linked together. Sucrose is table sugar. Lactose is the carbohydrate we find in dairy products. And maltose is in malt liquor. That's the best I can do. So there's what those are made of. Sucrose is glucose and fructose. Lactose is glucose and galactose. And then maltose is two molecules of glucose. Here are polysaccharides or complex carbohydrates. The top one is starch or amylose. And you can see it's just a, a spiral of glucose molecules stuck together. At the bottom, we've got cellulose, which is kind of what plants structure is made out of. And it's this lattice of glucose molecules stuck together. 
here's glycogen, which is this fun little chain of glucose. Glycogen's the only one of these three that we actually make. The other two come from plants. But glycogen is how we, one way anyway, that we store glucose. Your liver and your muscles can directly metabolize glycogen. So what do carbohydrates do? Well, mostly they're fuel. Now there are carbohydrates used in cell recognition and holding DNA together and some structure, but for the most part, when we consider carbohydrates, we're considering them as cellular fuel. We're gonna burn that crap to make ATP. More on that later. Lipids, a lot more variable. Lipids, one, are hydrophobic. Carbohydrates are hydrophilic. You can dissolve sugar in water. Lipids are not, they're hydrophobic, so they're, they're non-polar molecules. They're soluble in other lipids and organic solvents. A lot more variance in structure here. So a fatty acid is one type of lipid, a chain of between four and 24 carbon atoms. It looks like that. We have a carboxylic acid group on one end and a methyl group on the other. And a bunch of those two carbon acetyl groups in the middle. It's a polymer, which means we get the same thing over and over. Here's a glycerol. Now let's take three fatty acids and get to that glycerol. And what we get is a triglyceride, which we see at the bottom. Triglycerides are what we think of as fat. They're neutral. This should say non-polar, not polar. Sorry, typo on my part. So they're hydrophobic molecules. Now, the term saturated and unsaturated fat comes up quite a bit. A saturated fat is typically an animal fat. It's solid at room temperature. Think bacon grease. Saturated fats look like uh, this. You see saturated. So there's no double bonds through here. They're all single bonds there. Carbon, carbon. Down at the bottom, you have an unsaturated fat, and you can see that double bond there and that double bond there. Unsaturated fats tend to be liquid at room temperature because they've got those double bonds. Plant oils tend to be unsaturated fats. A trans fat, it's talking about the position of these hydrogens here around that double bond. This, is, this would be a cis fat because the hydrogens are all on the same side of that double bond. A trans fat, we would move this hydrogen to the other side. So they're on the opposite sides of the carbon atoms. This changes its uh, physical properties. They don't really happen in nature. We made trans fats. Why? Well, plant oils are really cheap, but if you leave them on the shelf, they go stale. Animal fats are super stable. You'll notice you can go buy uh, lard at Market Street and it's not refrigerated. Like that crap's just on the shelf in a block. And it'll, it'll stay there for a while. It has a pretty long shelf life and super tasty. Um, that semi-solid texture is, is better for baking. It gives you a better texture. If you've ever made tamales, you can't use oil. I mean, you can, but it sucks. So you use, you use the lard. The thing is, is, it's not like you do liposuction on the pig, right? You have to kill the pig to get the lard and they tend to be more expensive to produce. Plant oils, for what you could raise that pig for, you could make infinity gallons of soybean oil because that stuff's so cheap. It's super cheap to grow and get the oil. It's a byproduct. It's awesome. So, in 1902, a German chemist patented this process of hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is when we take hydrogen atoms, we bounce them off this plant oil, and we disrupt that bond so that we produce a trans fat. That's a partially hydrogenated oil. Anytime you see partially hydrogenated on something, that means that it's a trans fat. In 1909, Procter & Gamble bought the patent and they started making partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil. They called that Crisco. So, World War I hit, 
And when World War I hit, we had a shortage of stuff, butter, for instance. What we had was is an abundance of soybean oil. So we partially hydrogenated it and created margarine. Add some butter flavoring. It works out great. It's, it's super cheap. The thing is, is that uh, in, in doing this and creating this, this trans fat, we, we've created the molecule that our, our body doesn't really know what to do with. It, it doesn't metabolize well. So trans fats are implicated in lots of disease processes. Um, different types of, of cancer, and especially things like coronary artery disease. There's lots of correlation there. As such, they've been banned at this point. The, the FDA is, has said that you should not have trans fats in foods. Um, the, the lack of, of, of trans fats has changed things. So um, we don't use this as much as we used to. Crisco, for instance, is not just a, a trans fat now. Um, Crisco is a blend of, of unsaturated fats that creates that texture. It's not just partially hydrogenated soybean oil. Um, before the FDA banned them across the board, they got banned in different places. New York City banned them after they found that lots of their population was dying of heart disease. And uh, California banned them except for frying donuts, which cracks me up every time I think about it. There's like a donut lobby in California bribing congressmen to not ban the way they were frying donuts. McDonald's and places like that uh, pulled trans fats years ago. They saw the, the writing on the wall there and they were gonna get sued for people having heart attacks. The thing is, is that uh, food manufacturers can uh, say they have zero trans fat as long as there's less than half a gram per serving. So if you ever see anything that says zero trans fat and you flip it over and it's like partially hydrogenated peanut oil, there's still trans fat there, but not enough for them to care about. That's not saying it's good for you, it's just saying they don't care. What does fat do? Now, carbohydrates are fuel. Lots of function for fat. Saturated fats are, you know, fat. They're insulating and they're fuel reserves. We can metabolize fat, it's stored energy. Um, they hold some of the organs in place like the kidneys. Unsaturated fats, we don't really do that. It's a plant thing. Phospholipids are what your cell membranes are made out of. It's a modified triglyceride. Here's a phospholipid. So we've got these fatty acid tails down there with a phosphate head. Phospholipids are amphipathic. They're both hydrophilic and hydrophobic at the same time. We'll talk about that when we get to cells. Like I said, this is what your cell membranes are made out of. And here you see those phospholipids. 
Steroids are lipids. Steroids are hormones that are necessary for you to be alive. Steroids are all made out of cholesterol, which is another lipid that's necessary for you to be alive. So there's cholesterol. Cholesterol is found in cell membranes. It keeps the cell membrane stable. And it's the parent molecule for steroids like testosterone and estrogen and aldosterone. Fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, those are all lipids that you need for homeostasis. So there's a lot more function for lipids, right? Structure and storage and chemical signaling. Icosinoids are lipids. They're chemical signals between cells, part of inflammation and blood clotting, labor contractions. Now we come to proteins. Proteins are polymers of amino acids, meaning we get a bunch of amino acids stuck together. Here we see the base structure for a protein, that little pink R off to the side is sort of the, the variable group between the different amino acids. There are 20 of them that we care about, and they're all identical except for that little pink R group there. And the properties of each amino acid is determined by that little pink R group. The amino acids in a protein determine structure and thereby the function of that protein. And so here we see amino acids being stuck together in this sort of linear protein. 20 amino acids in you. Eight of them we can't make. The other 12 we got. Eight of them we can't make. We have to eat those. And those are called essential amino acids. We get them from plants. Protein structure. The primary structure of a protein, it's just the order of the amino acids. This is what's coded for on your DNA. DNA is a blueprint for making proteins. So if we just wrote down all the proteins in order that are coded for in the DNA, or sorry, all the amino acids that are coded for on the DNA that make up a protein, that's the primary structure, like so. So there's an amino acid, there's an amino acid. You're just writing them down in order. Now here's what's gonna happen. We've got these R groups up here and they've got their own properties. And we've got these hydrogens and these oxygens up here. Now remember that hydrogen is gonna have a partial positive, that oxygen is gonna have a partial negative. Who knows what that R group's got going on? And those positives and those negatives and those R groups are gonna push and pull on each other. Remember we said hydrogen bonds are, are very important. Well, this is where this comes into play. The secondary structure of the protein will either be an alpha helix, which kind of looks like a corkscrew or a beta pleated sheet, which is a zigzag. And the hydrogen bonds formed by these amino acids push and pull on each other and cause it to either curl up or, or zigzag back and forth. So there's our alpha helix and then there's our beta sheet. And those little dotted lines are hydrogen bonds. Now with this secondary structure, that structure, and again, these see our little green R groups out there. Those little green R groups, again, are gonna interact with one another and push and pull on each other. And that gives us our tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is the three-dimensional shape of a protein. It's caused by what's called a disulfide bridge between those amino acids. And it creates the final three-dimensional form of the protein. The tertiary structure, by determining this final three-dimensional form, also determines the function of a protein. Remember when we talked about the sort of the history of anatomy, we said form and function are uh, complementary. Here's a really good example of that. The shape of a protein, the tertiary structure of a protein determines its function. Form and function are linked together. So here we see the tertiary structure of a prealbumin molecule. This is a transthyrethin, the protein that transports thyroid hormone and serum and cerebral spinal fluid. And the tertiary structure is this globular structure on the outside, and it's laid on top of the secondary structure that you see on the inside so that you can see what those little secondary structures look like, the alpha helices and the beta sheets. All proteins will have primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Some of them also have what's called a quaternary structure. And a quaternary structure is when you have multiple polypeptides or proteins linked together, like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's actually four of them. Here's a, a functional prealbumin molecule, and those two pieces are, are held together head to tail to form this bigger overall structure. Each of these little polypeptide chains has its own tertiary structure, but then they combine together into a bigger overall quaternary structure. Not all proteins do this. 
Denaturation means we're breaking a protein. We break that tertiary structure. And by changing the shape of a protein, by breaking that tertiary structure, we change its function. Heat, pH, we'll screw this up. Uh, fry an egg. When you fry an egg, you're denaturing the proteins in that algae albumin. And they're going from being uh, that clear, liquidy goo to a solid. And it's permanent. You're not going to turn that back into the clear liquid it was. A conjugated protein has something that's not an amino acid or, or a moiety or a prosthetic group. Like hemoglobin has got that iron ring stuck in the middle of it. Enzymes, like I said, biological catalysts, increase the speed of a reaction. This is a chart of the activation energy. What this shows you is that without an enzyme, it takes that much energy to make this reaction happen. With an enzyme, it takes less energy so that reaction can happen faster. Enzymes typically end in ASE and they tell you the reaction they catalyze. So we have something like, like lactase, which breaks down lactose. Here we see an enzyme putting something together. Quite often that we'll be talking about enzymes pulling stuff apart. Nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, this is genetic material. They're made of nucleotides. We're not gonna get into the depth of like all these different nucleotides for DNA or, or RNA. DNA, protein synthesis, big blueprint. There you see DNA in case you've never seen Jurassic Park. That's what DNA looks like. I don't expect you to match base pairs together or tell me about the three prime, the five prime, the any of that crap. RNA, single stranded molecule, more on this as necessary. ATP is the energy molecule for us. In ATP, we get these high energy phosphate bonds there. And they can be used to transfer that energy to other things. When you see ATP, think energy. The energy we're going to use to power all the other mechanisms. It's going to phosphorylate stuff. And this is going to be important later. We're talking about muscles or really anything. So here's ATP causing this transport protein to work. There's muscle contraction, chemistry. Okay. All right. So that's going to wrap up what we've got for chemistry. The next thing we'll talk about is the cell, which actually does have a lot more interesting stuff than stupid boring chemistry. So the next lecture you'll need is cells and I'll have that up later. So I'm having to go back and, and redo lots of these because my sound was so bad on the old ones. So bear with me as I go back and record these. Questions again on Blackboard, post questions in that forum, email me, text me, and I will see you when we talk about cells.